everybody is able to get the galaxy. They're able to find the, the document. All right. Since nobody's trickled in for a while, we're just going to get this started um, so we can all get out of here a little early. So my name's Lauren. Um, I work here at MSI. I'm part of the research informatics group here. Um, a little bit of a guess about my background. I have a PhD in cell biology, so I'm a biologist first. But I started doing computational biology kind of halfway through my graduate career, and now I do it full time here at MSI. Um, so the risk group here at MSI works mainly with life sciences users. We do a lot of genomics um, analysis. We help to foster this Galaxy instance here at the U by giving guidance in terms of like what tools should be involved. Um, and I know how to use Galaxy, so I answer questions when people send emails about how to use Galaxy, and I teach these nice tutorials. Um, and alongside of that, we work with uh, individual research groups on campus, so you guys can come to us, have questions that you don't know how to answer yourself. I can work with you to help answer them. Um, on a short-term basis, just kind of, you can come sit in my office for a while and we can talk about it, but then also on a longer-term basis um, via kind of a fee-for-service model. So that's the way kind of RISC itself works. So today we're going to be learning about Galaxy. So the point of this tutorial is kind of 60%, let's just learn about the Galaxy interface and touch it a little bit and understand how it works, and I can give you a bunch of good reasons why you guys as kind of novice computer computational biologists should like Galaxy and maybe want to use it. And then 40% about like what Illumina data looks like and what good Illumina data looks like and what bad Illumina data looks like. Um, and so we don't do a lot of analysis in this tutorial, but we're going to do a lot of like clicking on buttons and touching Galaxy and getting used to that interface. And so if you guys then kind of towards the end of the class want to ask me questions about like the actual biology you're trying to figure out, we'll definitely have time for that at the end. Um, so no worries. All right. So, Galaxy. Um, so when you guys log into Galaxy, so when you guys first logged in, oh, I got logged out, so we'll do it again. So there are lots of Galaxy instances that exist on this planet. Um, the University of Minnesota and MSI host this instance, and so it's going to have this nice big M in it. So when you guys logged in, um, hopefully you saw your username, and then maybe there was like a drop down, and it said tutorial, and everybody kind of logged in with their tutorial. No? Okay, let's see if we can, you can log me out and I can show you guys that. Um, so normally, you don't want to log in with tutorial, and in fact, that tutorial option will disappear, but it gets you in a special line, and so we get to cut everybody today. So we want to be in this tutorial group. So again, I'm just logging in using my U of M credentials. Um, if you got, I'm going to go to Galaxy. It's probably just going. So here, so I'm a member of lots of groups, so there's a big long list here. For you guys, if you already have an MSI account, maybe there's two. So there's maybe one that says tutorial and then one that says your normal group. Or if you're, this is the first time you've ever touched MSI systems, you might only be in the tutorial group until it pops it, you into the right line. So I'm going to stick with my MSI staff, but you guys should all select tutorial if it's an option. Um, again, everything will still work. Worst comes to worst, you just kind of have to sit around and wait. For a little while. I'll, I'll come. So go to galaxy.msi.umn.edu. Yeah. And then here, just click the user for me. I'm just going to just log out. Oh yeah, and it popped you back to that as well. Yeah. Um, let's try logging in again. Perfect. So it's just remembering. Um, so let's go to uh, history here. Um, history. Uh, Chrome preferences. Oh, ooh, tool browsing data. Yeah. So it's like remembering. So now this time when you log into Galaxy, it should ask you. Okay. Yeah. So that's me. I'll stay here and stay. No worries. Just log into Galaxy. Yeah, just in the Galaxy. Okay. It'll pop you to the G A L. Yeah. Oh, it's in Chrome. Oh, I can't. I didn't 
<laughs> oh, it's, yeah, D-A-L, Southern Messiah dot M-A-W. Okay. So D-A-L, yeah. It's okay, I can't spell it right. And then dot M-S-I dot U of M. Log in, and it'll give me a little drop down menu. Can I do it? No, we're not going to do it. That's all right. <laughs> it'll still work. Okay. Um, we'll still have a good shortcut. Okay. So, this is the main Galaxy interface. So, Galaxy kind of has three parts it has this left bar here. These are where all of your software tools live. So these are going to be the pieces of software that you read about in papers, so BWA, Cuffdiff, um, HiSat, you know, those kind of tools that you guys have all read about and you know you need to use, but you don't really know how. They're going to live here on the left. And so these headers kind of pop down into um, lots of different tools that are under them. There is no like magical way of me telling you how to find tools. The search bar works pretty well. Um, but one thing I will say is if you, so we click on a tool, so let's click on sortbed here. We get some information about the tool and how to run the tool here in the middle. If you read this and you're like, hey, I think that's what I need to do, just try it. <laughs> you're not gonna break anything. You're not gonna delete data. You're not gonna wreck something you've done in the past. Um, so don't be afraid to try a tool even if you don't know if it's the perfect tool. Um, that's kind of my number one rule is you, you can't hurt anything, so don't worry about it. So yeah, so we've got the toolbar here on the left, and the center space is kind of your information pane. So again, if I click on any of these tools, um, click on one that doesn't stink, um, how to run the tool, and then kind of information about the tool is gonna show up here in the middle. And then on the right, you have your history pane. And so Galaxy is amazing in that it's going to keep track of all of the little pieces of data that you create, but it's also gonna keep track of how you created it. And those things are gonna travel together. So as we use Galaxy, this history pane gets populated, first with kind of your raw data, and then with your process data as you go along. But then if you click on one of these little boxes that you'll see show up here on the right, you'll be able to recreate exactly what you did to make that piece of data. You can also then, let's say I do a really nice analysis, I really like it, I did it on one set of samples, I wanna do it on another set of samples. I can extract the workflow, so just the things I've done from this history, and then apply it to new sets of data as well. And so this is really where Galaxy um, shines in terms of its functionality, is its ability to kind of be your running notebook for you, and to y allows you to recreate every analysis you've ever done. And then let's say you're having a problem, and you're like, hey, I'm stuck, I don't know what to do. You can also then share these histories with me or other people and say, hey, can you take a look at this and tell me what you think or, or what may be going wrong. Um, so Galaxy's pretty fancy that way. Cool, so today we're gonna be working with Illumina Data. So when you guys get sequencing done at the UMGC, here you get an email back that says, hey, your data's ready. And then they give you this like place where it lives and you're like, I don't know what that is. So when that happens, all you have to do is forward that email to help at msi.umn.edu, and we'll put it in what's called a data library, if you would like us to. And so data libraries are um, kind of a shared directory space, and anybody who's kind of in your group is gonna be able to look at this data library and use this data. And what's nice about putting, especially raw sequencing data into a data library space, is that if you use it, and the person sitting in lab next to you use it, we're not like making 12 copies of the same piece of data. It kind of just points to it. Um, and so it saves on your storage costs, which is nice. So we've got some data for today's tutorial, also in a data library. So if you guys wanna click on shared data, data libraries. So mine's gonna take a little while to populate, sorry, just cause I get to see all of the data libraries. But in the search thing up here, if you just wanna type QC, there'll be a data lab library called G Illumina QC or something like that. Um, that will be for today's tutorial. And so I can tell you what it's called because I have it in here. <sighs> dun, dun, dun. Yeah, QC Illumina data is what the data library is called.
Were you guys able to find it? Yeah, sorry. Mine just takes a long time. All right, well, inside of that data library, there's um, a file called, oh man, called rnaseq.fastq. So go ahead and there's like a checkbox next to that, click on it, and then there's uh, up in the top right, there's gonna be an import to current history. Go ahead and import it to your current history and you'll get a little green thing at the top that says it did it. And so then the home page for Galaxy to kind of get back to that three panel thing is this analyze data button. All right, so mine showed up now. So if I type QC, here's QC Lumina data. I can click on this RNA seek.fastq. Um, and then I can import to history. Yes, this is my new, un my current unnamed history. Click import. Now I got this little green thing that said it did it. And then if I click analyze data, It's over here on the right. Do we all are we all got it in our history? No. Okay. What are we stuck on? QC of Illumina data. So you can just type QC in the search. All right, it's a good habit not to leave your histories unnamed because then you get a bunch of them and then you don't know what they are. <laughs> um, so to name your history, you can just kind of click on the unnamed, where it says unnamed history. I'm just gonna name mine tutorial, uh, tutorial one, and then I'm gonna press return and that'll actually save the name. If you just kind of click away, it'll probably just say unnamed history again. But na again, name it something that means something to you. Um, so in our history pane, we've got our first little element here. And so if we click on the name, it's going to give us like a preview of the element. It's going to tell us how big it is. So this one's really tiny because it's a toy. Um, it's going to tell us what format Galaxy thinks that it is in, which is this FastQ Sanger. So lots of times when you get FastQ data, again, from UMGC, if I were to click on this, it would just say FastQ right here. Um, to fix that, I would click on this little pencil icon and I would do convert format, I mean, excuse me, data type, and I would select this FastQ Sanger. So again, pencil, data type, FastQ Sanger. And you know, again, for inevitably, when you forget that, it's on this document as well. <laughs> um, and so why do we want it to be FastQ Sanger? Just because that's kind of the data type that some of these tools are looking for. So if you find that you're trying to use a FastQ file, and it's not kind of appearing as something you're allowed to select with one of the tools, it's probably because of this little pencil icon thing. And so you just need to change it to FastQ Sanger. Cool. So the other thing I can click, once this kind of stops thinking, um, is this little eyeball, which will let me view kind of a bigger set of the data. And so here we can see what FastQ data looks like. Um, so FastQ format is a repeating uh, four lines. So this first line here is the read name. Um, technically, it tells you something about like what machine it was run on and where exactly it came from and blah, 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 blah. But it doesn't matter. Mostly, it's just like a unique identifier for every read that comes off um, your specific sequencing run. The next line is the sequence itself. So again, it's going to be ATs, Cs, and Gs, and then some Ns. And Ns are unknowns. Um, we're going to have a little holder line. And then we're going to have the quality score for each individual base. And so these characters all have ASCII numerical equivalents. So I don't know what they are off the top of my head, but I don't have to because the FastQ Wikipedia page is amazing. Um, so again, exclamation point is 33. And I is 73, and then you know these are all the kind of the characters in between um, that you could see in your you know Sanger encoded quality data. 
So I don't know about you guys, but I can't do ASCII in my head, and I definitely can't do it, you know, 150 base pairs times 10 million reads um, by looking at it. So while this is a nice format, it's supposed to be machine readable. It's not supposed to be human readable. So we have a couple tools that are going to help us kind of summarize what this data looks like as a whole. And so the first tool we're going to run is something called FastQC. So we can just in the search tool, um, search bar up here, type FastQC. It's going to be this first tool we see. Select it. Um, it's about the easiest tool on the planet to run. It wants a fast Q file. You really don't have to care about these other two things. And we're just going to hit execute. Um, so there's a couple of stages or phases your history items can be in. So they can be gray, which means they're kind of waiting in line to run. So again, you, your guys' jobs are getting in the same line on the same hardware that they would be run if you were using like MSI's machines at the command line, which is good for you because it's a lot of really fast machines, but it can be bad for you also because sometimes they're busy. Um, they can be in this yellow state, which means running, or they can be in a red state that means something bad happened, there's a bug, um, or they can be in a green state that, that says they finished. Um, and so what I'm hoping is that your guys' is running, even if mine isn't. Um, and these should be done pretty quickly. But if not, I've got some examples I can show you. Um, are any of your guys' running or green or anything? Yeah, yours is running? Yours is probably not, because they're not in tutorial. Yeah. Um, that's okay. We'll see if we can get mine to run. Um, so I can show you when we'll just go to a different, well, yeah, so mine's probably going to be stuck for a little while. So we'll go to another one. Uh, where did I leave it? I have one that's just, yeah. Um, all right, so here's just an old history that I have using the same data. So again, I've taken this, um, this RNA-seq FASTQ. If I click this little recycle here, you guys can see that I did exactly what we just did. So ran FastQC on this um, FastQ file. But now I can look at the web page and see what it looks like. So here's the FastQC web page output, whereas the raw data is going to be like a table of numbers. Um, so for this particular tool, the web page is the most useful. Um, so what does what is the output of FastQC look like? So the uh, First thing we're going to get is this sort of summary of quality across the length of the read. So our reads here are 40 base pairs long. If you did 150 base pair sequencing, it would be 150 base pairs long. Um, if you're using the MySeq and you're getting like 250 base pairs, it would be 250 base pairs long. So it's going to be the size of kind of the read that you ordered. Um, you'll see that this kind of plot is broken up into green, yellow, and red. These are actually pretty good. Um, visual representations of quality metrics. So green here um, is anything above a FRED score of 28. These are really high quality. These are gonna basically saying that the sequencing machine is very confident that it's calling the right base at that uh, position. Um, yellow here is sort of medium. Red is, is less confident. And so I will say that unless I'm really struggling to try to conserve a lot of my data, so like maybe I didn't, the, the sequencing run was not very good, so I don't have quite enough reads to do my downstream analysis, or there's something about the prep itself where I know the data is going to be bad, I don't use things with the quality score less than 20. Um, and then I will be sort of picky between 20 and 25. If I have a lot of data, then I'll use 25 because I can afford to throw more of it away. If I don't have a lot of data, then I'll use because I kind of need to be selfish and conserve some of the data. And so what does a lot of data mean? If you're doing kind of gene-level RNA-seq, 
and you just want gene level expression differences, if you've got 12 million reads, you're fine. Um, if you're doing like a whole genome sequencing and you're trying to call SNPs and you want like 38, 30x average coverage, you're going to need a lot, you know, hundreds, 100 million reads per sample, depending on how big your genome is. So it's very kind of dependent on what sort of experiment you're doing. Um, UMGC is really good. You're probably not going to have bad data. So <laughs> there's also that. So this sort of downtrend that you guys see as we move from the beginning of the read to the end of the read is very normal. This is just a function of the sequencing chemistry and it being on the machine for a long time and, you know, it's an inability to kind of clean things, uh, um, you know, because it has to do the washes in between the different floor floors that it flushes in. So this is really normal and as the reads get longer, you'll actually get kind of more of a drop. Um, and if you're doing the really long reads on the MySeq and um, you're doing like, I get a lot of people who do amplicons on the MySeq, but their amplicons are like a lot shorter than the sequencing they get. So it's maybe 100 base pair amplicon, but they've done 300 base pair sequencing. The last uh, 50 base pairs look like garbage because it's kind of just like sucking in whatever it can for those last 50. Again, totally normal. Um, so that's what this first plot is about. The second plot here is a per tile sequence qual quality. So this would tell you like if you had a bubble, the, on the tile that they're actually doing the sequencing on the machine, or if there was like a stripe down the middle here that was bad, or some, some kind of location specific badness that occurred. But because our read quality is really high, this just is showing us that it's all really high as well. Um, our per sequence quality score, so now it's kind of a summary of the sequence as a whole. This is very normal. Most of them are high, some of them are kind of low. And so we'll do some trimming later to first um, remove some of these kind of lower quality specific base pairs, but then also to then throw away entire sequences that are bad or lower quality. Um, this per base sequence content, it's just going to look random um, and even across the reads, so unless, again, you've done some sort of amplicon where the front half is like, 50% GC in the back half is 50, you know, or is 90% AT. You know, this should look pretty standard and, and even across um, the entire length of the read. GC content it looks weird here, but only because our file size is really small. But your theoretical and your GC kind of this red line should match again, unless you're doing one of those weird bacteria that's like 90% GC or something. Um, so those should look the same. This per base N content should be very low. So you should be in the floor. So again, ends is the sequencing machine's way of saying, I don't know what goes here. This distribution, length distribution, before you do your trimming, they should all be the same length um, or very close to the same length. Again, I think the MySeq can give you slightly different lengths of data potentially. Um, so we've got this weird little triangle going on. Once we do the trimming, we basically want to see that when we do the trimming, most of our data is still full length and that we're not like cutting everything in half and we don't know why. But again, if we've got a special situation where you know that's going to happen, then that's um, something to keep in mind. Sequence duplication levels. So sequence duplication levels can tell you, tells you really two things. So one, um, your sequence duplication level should be low unless, again, you're doing some sort of amplicon resequencing and so you really only have like one sequence that you're sequencing a whole lot. Um, but really, you know, we've got this little peak here that's saying, hey, we've got some sequence in here that we're seeing more than 5,000 times. This is um, Illumina adapter contamination. Um, and so this is the sequencing, the piece of DNA that you inserted between the Illumina adapters isn't, is shorter than the amount of sequencing you've done. So now your sequencing chemistry has run into your Illumina adapters and it's happened a lot of times. And so this is actually, sequence that we want to get rid of. And so that's also part of our trimming. So we're going to trim for quality and then we're going to trim to, to remove Illumina specific adapter sequences. Because if we leave them in there and then you go to do your mapping step, they can mess up your mapping because they're not sequences that are part of whatever genome that you guys are working with. So they manifest themselves as this little bump here in this duplication level plot. And then they also show up down here again. Um, in the what, what are the actual sequences that are making up this little bump here. Um, for the 
for your guys' newer experiments, we're using Nextera transpose on adapters or some of these other adapters. Um, it'll show up here, but then you'll also get a plot down here that, that, that goes up at the end that says you have adapter contamination. This data is just really old. <laughs> so the, it doesn't have these adapters. It has an older version of the Illumina adapters. Um, Kamer content, same thing. You shouldn't really have overrepresented Kamers unless, again, there's a reason for it. So this spike in the Kamers down here is just saying, hey, we've got Kamers that are part of those Illumina adapter sequences that are now overrepresented. So it's kind of just a replication of the same information. Cool. So then how do we get rid of all these things? Um, so we, we want to do a little bit of quality trimming. We want to do a little bit, mostly we really want to get rid of these adapter sequences and we want to get them out, the O's out of our data. So we have this nice tool called Trimomatic. So if we just trim O two ends. Yeah, just two ends. Um, there's two of them. I don't, it doesn't really matter which one you use. So Trimomatic. So Trimomatic can do lots of different things. So it can do the quality, it can do the adapters. Um, and so we'll kind of build this tool um, and piece a few parts together to have it do all the different things we want to do. So first we want to put it in single end mode because we've got single end data right now. So if you have paired end data, then you're going to have two FASTQ files per each sample. If you have single end data, you're only going to have one. You guys will probably have paired end data because that's like 99% of all experiments that are done now. So we will do a paired end example, but I'm going to make you do this first. Um, great. So the first thing we want to do is actually uh, look for those adapter sequences. And so here under task, um, there's a task called Illumina Clip. And so this is going to look for those adapter sequences um, based on the one that we tell it to look for. And so if I go back to my little notes here, um, da, da, da. we talked about that already. Yeah, so we want to have it look for these true seek to single end adapters, um, which is the one that came up. And so how do you know which adapters to have it look for? Well, so one, you might see a specific adapter type show up in that FASTQC plot. Two, you can ask the sequencing core which ones they use. Three, you try one, and then you see if the adapter contamination goes away. And if it doesn't, you try a different one, which is how I tend to do it. Um, and then, so, so we've got Illumina Clip. We've got the, s the adapter selected. I have never changed these. Um, other options ever in my entire life ever. And so you can probably leave them the same as well. All right, so why do we want to look for the adapter sequences first? So adapter contamination tends to also be lower quality. So if we trim for quality first, we're going to remove some of those sequences, which is just going to make them harder to find. So we want to remove the adapter sequences first before we then do any quality-based um, analysis so that we can make sure and find them um, as easily as possible. All right, so after this Illumina Clip task, we're gonna do a few other tasks. So if you click Insert Task, we'll get another box here that shows up. Um, we're gonna do something called leading. So again, as a function of the chemistry, the very first three bases and the very last three bases can sometimes be real crap. So we're gonna look, for the, look at those kind of independently on each read, and then if they are really garbage, we're going to throw them away. Um, so that's what leading does. There's another task called trailing. Same thing. First few, last few. Um, and then we're going to do something called sliding window. So sliding window is then going to start at the beginning of your read and move towards the end, in this case in a four base pair window size. And then I would like to say that it has to have a quality of at least 25, because I'm going to be picky, to then get to, to be included in our read. And so what happens is if it starts at base number 1, slides to base number 10, and then when it gets to 10, it says 10 through 14, drop below 25, it's going to clip that whole rest of the read off. And it's going to go away, because it can't pull out chunks in the middle 
then again, we've now created a new sequence that doesn't actually exist in your data. So from there to the end, we'll get removed. Cool. And then the last thing we're going to do is uh, another tool called, yes? No, it's so, so window size is how many base pairs? So four. Oh, yeah, required quality says in that the in within that four base pair window, the average has to be at least 25. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no worries. And so for min length, um, so if you guys remember, we've got 40 base pair reads. Um, so we don't really have a lot of room to do trimming. If you have 150 base pair reads, you have a lot more room to do trimming. And I would say your minimum length, you could probably turn down to like 80 even. Um, but here we're going to leave it pretty long because I want longer sequences because they have more of a chance of mapping uniquely to my genome. Cool. So again, um, Illumina clip, leading, trailing, sliding window, min length. And it's all, again, on this, this guy as well. So don't feel like you have to have that memorized. And then we just click execute. I'm going to let you guys click execute. I'll click it. We'll see if it runs. And so you notice when you click execute, there's kind of one box here that that shows up in your history. So one new one. Um, if you click on it, it'll just say stop doing it, run. But it's just going to be another FASTQ file as your output. Um, so again, once this trimming is over, you get another FASTQ file. It looks almost exactly like the other one, because again, none of us can read ASCII characters in our brains. Um, but if we run FASTQC on it again, which I think you guys should totally do, and I don't have to wait. So like here is my number, this box number 11 here is the, the job I just set up. And I can actually set FASTQC up, if I can type, to run on this guy before he's finished. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. Galaxy knows how to wait for it to finish before it runs the other thing. So I can build up an entire list of things that I want to do and just let it kind of run in the background. So what else is nice about Galaxy is like, I don't have to sit around and wait for it. If I just log back in, it's just going to be sitting here waiting for me to come back. And so this is good because again, those mapping steps, so when we kind of the next thing you would do beyond this class where you would take your reads and then map them back to your genome can takes three you know hours or lots of time so you don't want to like sit around and wait for it you want to set it and then go get coffee or go home or something and come back later and check on it great so we ran traumatic I'm gonna you guys know how to run fast QC so we run fast QC again and I've got this other sort of output that tells me hey, look, I made my already pretty good data even better. Um, I got rid of some of my, you know, you know, my adapter contamination. But I don't really remember exactly what my data looked like to start with. And so it would be nice to be able to kind of look at these graphs side by side. Don't worry, we can do that. So if you guys click on this little scratch book icon up here, this little matrix. And then we open the original guy as well. And then we click on this guy again. Now they'll be open next to each other. So this is our original data here. And then this is our trimmed data on the left. And you can actually do this for four, you know, or as many will fit on your screen. Um, and so if we kind of scroll through it, we can look and see how things have changed. And so again, if we look at this like sequence length distribution, we'll see that that's shifted quite a bit. So here it's all at 40. Here we've got a very tiny distribution, you know, because we said you had to be, as, I guess I like at least 36 to be in here. But again, most of our data is full length, which is great. But then we got rid of that little bump here. That was our sequence contamination. This list of overrepresented sequences has gotten much shorter and also like the count has gone way down and the percentage has gone way down, which is good. Um, and then uh, that didn't change, but you know our camera content has all kind of evened out, and so I think I've made my good quality data now free of adapters. And so that's kind of the comparisons you really want to make between your your original data set and then your trim data set to say, 
do I think I, I cleaned it up? Cool. So, so you guys actually got your things to run. They're running. Yeah, OK, cool. Then um, I'm going to turn Scratchbook off. Um, why don't we grab a new history? So use this little gear icon, and then just say Create New. Cool. Give it another name. So this one can be like Tutorial 2. And then this time, I'm going to give you guys some paired in data to work with so that you can try to see if you can figure out how to trim paired in data. Um, it's really easy. And again, it's in this document, so feel free to read. Um, so if we go back to the data library, yep. and you go back to QC of Illumina data, mine never shows up. Well, anyway, in that QC folder, there's two files that kind of obviously go together. So you'll just click the boxes next to both of them and then import them into this current history, so this tutorial two or whatever you named it. Um, come on. All right, that's taking too long. Cool. So yeah, there's this uh, tutorial file R1 and tutorial file R2. And so what I want you guys to do is run FastQC on both of these guys. So you'll have to run FastQC twice. Um, and then run Trimomatic on these files as well, but again, run it in paired in mode, um, which will then let you kind of use both of these files at once. Um, just FYI, R1 is the same thing as forward, R2 is the same thing as reverse. Yeah? Can you actually do this individually? Or can you mm -mm, yeah. Do well, for right now, let's do it individually, and then um, I will introduce you to something called yeah. dataset collections. Okay. Um, but I don't have a good example for data set collections, unfortunately. But we'll talk about it. Mm -hmm. But again, you can always use the um, little recycle. So you run it one time, and then you're like, I don't want to go find it again. So then let me just switch the input. But now I run it the same way. kind of cheat a little bit and leave this this little half up for you guys. So when it's running on its new user, uh -huh. I notice that there's option D one. Yeah. So it doesn't um so I just have to do it on the one that has a data one and it's yeah, so you can go back and um, rename them. Okay. So if you do this edit attribute, I can give it a different name. But yeah, it's automatically going to kind of name things by the tool you ran and then on the data one. Okay. And so yeah, so here it says on data one, so I can go back down here and say, oh yeah, that's my R1. Okay. Yeah. Because so you never continue using the tutorial file R1. No. No. It means it's still just waiting. Oh. Is it still gray with the exclamation yeah. point? Yeah. So if you like click refresh, it exclamation point will probably go away.
don't forget all of the tasks. How many people got fast QC running on their two file? Okay. So we're all working on Trimomatic right now? Okay. Yeah, it's in this little thing. It's on page 14. Oop, no, not page 14. It's on page, well, yeah, 14 and 15. But it's really the same that we used before, just a different adapter. So now we're using truthseek2.pe instead of se. Mm -hmm. And maybe you want to change the minimum length. I don't remember how long these guys are, but it's okay. I don't have to because I can just look. Yeah, see these are 100 base pairs long. So I would say a minimum length of 40 is maybe a little bit aggressive. And I would probably do like 90, 10 percentage, maybe 80. So again, we want to run Trimmatic in paired in mode. So you're going to give it tutorial file R1. So your R1 file is your forward read. Your R2 file is your reverse read. So we want to run that Illumina Clips task. But again, this time with this TrueSeq2 PE adapter. Um, then you know we don't need to mess with this stuff. We're going to do leading. We're going to do trailing. We're going to do sliding window. Again, I cranked the quality up pretty high here. We might be less stringent in real life. And then for this minimum length, 
apparently I set mine to 20 when I did this, I think to be kind of silly, but really because these are 100 base pairs long, I'd probably want to be more like 80, maybe 90. Um, and so have any of you guys actually gotten to the point where you clicked execute? Yeah? So what was, so if you guys remember with our single end data, we clicked execute and we just got one little box that showed up. How many boxes show up if I click execute now? Four, yeah. So why do we think we have four? How many were you expecting and why do you think we have four? So we have two input files. We're getting four output files. So if you guys remember how paired end data works, um, you're actually sequencing the same molecule. You're just doing it from the, op from the opposite directions. And so paired data does travel paired. So the original FASTQ file that you're getting, you know, if we went to line 100, those would be paired. If we went line to a million and a half, those would be paired. And that's the way the, the file is organized. And so if Trimomatic does its thing and it's looking at um, the R1 file and it says, hey, I've trimmed this one, now it's too short, I need to throw it away, it also has to remove it from that R2 file so that your final paired files maintain that order. But if your R2 read is still good, it's going to put it in this separate file that's now single end. And so you've got um, a file called forward paired um, and then forward unpaired. So these unpaired ones are going to be reads that were bad in R2 but that are good in R1. And so this is still good data. Um, Whereas your paired files, so the forward and reverse paired, are going to again be paired from top to bottom. And your reverse unpaired are going to be R2 reads that are good, but their R1 partner was bad and got thrown away. And so, so dep again, depending on what downstream tools you're going to use, some um, tools can use these unpaired data as well. Um, but, but most of the time, you're not going to have a lot of information in these unpaired um, data sets, and this is actually something to check. You want to see if most of your data maintains its paired status or not. Um, and again, you can do that by running FastQC and just seeing how many reads. So at the top of the FastQC, um, it just tells you how many sequences are in there. Um, and then, so and then, so then you could run your mapping or your whatever you're going to do next, just with the paired data. And so I tend to just use paired data again, unless I'm trying to maintain keep as much data as possible, which tends to be like a whole genome sequencing sort of for SNP calling kind of scenario. Great. Um, and I think in this particular situation, these unpaired guys are actually empty because I gave you magic somehow. I didn't do it on purpose. Um, and so we'd run FastQC again. I tend to just run it on the paired stuff because it's the only things I really care about. Um, and so here, I've run it on the terminomatic results for my forward paired, or here is on my, oops, um, oops, not that one, this one, is on my reverse paired. So great, but I still want to kind of be able to maybe see them all next to each other, so we'll turn Scratchbook on again, and then click on all these guys. And then we can see them next to each other, which is pretty cool. At least I think it's pretty cool. Um, so here's our original forward. This is our original reverse. This is our trimmed forward. This is our trimmed reverse. So I think I can make them switch places. Yeah. Um, so forward's on this side, reverse is on this side. And so again, we can kind of scroll down and, and look that we've removed a lot of this garbage off of the end, which is nice in all cases. Um, and then uh, we've removed this stuff also, which is like whole sequences that are bad quality. So again, it doesn't even go down to past 27 anymore. Um, and then this didn't have a lot of adapter contamination, but that's okay. What is this one? You know, this is our sequence length distribution. Again, I had cranked mine down to like, so they all were at 100. I cranked it down to 20, so it looks really ridiculous. So really, I'd want to keep it more like about 80. And so we just have this peak here on the right, which is great. Um, so that's fine. I mean, we didn't have any adapters to begin with, so we didn't really do anything down there. So yeah, 
So again, this, this idea of I'm going to do some stuff, some trimming, I'm going to look at it, but it's not, you know, if I ended up throwing away too much data because maybe I was too strict or I still kind of have um, maybe a little bit of adapters that I'm missing or maybe I don't like that it's kind of still lower down here and I really want to get rid of all of this stuff, um, I can be more strict. But because we're using Galaxy, which is nice, um, you're not writing over your old data. So your original files are still here. Everything you do to them kind of gets saved, and what you did gets saved. So if I, did, again, decided, hey, that 20 was ridiculous, I just go back, click um, this recycle here. It's going to give me my original data sets back. And then I'm going to change 20 to 90, because that's kind of more of a realistic value and then just click Run Again, which is great. And that's what these guys up here are. Cool. So we've um, done a few things. Um, one of the other nice things that I mentioned in the beginning about Galaxy is this idea that you can do an analysis and then extract what you did out of it. And so that's called a workflow. So I can, um, from this history, so I'm actually going to delete these things that I added just because I don't need them. Um, so here's a nice analysis I did. I think it's really great. I probably want to do it again to another set of files. So I can go up here to this gear icon and say um, extract workflow. Um, and so if there were some things in this workflow or in this history that maybe you didn't want to do again, you could check or uncheck them as needed. Um, we can give it another name up here. So workflow from tutorial two, or again, whatever makes sense to you. And then we're going to create workflow. Great. And so from here, we can actually go and edit or further add to this workflow as we need it as well in what's called the workflow editor. So we could click edit right here, or we can go up to workflow. Yes, I'm going to leave the site. Um, and then select it from here. So let's go edit. And the workflow editor is kind of nice, a nice interface. Um, we can sort of drag these guys around so that they, we can see how everything's connected to each other. So again, you'll see that you know, R1 and R2 both go into different FastQC recalls, but then they also both go into Termomatic. And then these outputs from Termomatic go back into FastQC. Um, and you can kind of do that by following these lines. So for right now, um, we're not actually saving any of the output. And so to, to save output, we want to kind of turn on these little spidery asterisk marks. Um, so this basically says, hey, I would like to save the FastQ files that you're creating here. I would like to save these HTML files from FastQC to see what I've been able to do. So I could then go on from there. Um, and you know, again, like I kind of have mentioned, usually the next step from here is some sort of like mapping. So I could then add like my next mapping step by just selecting the tool and then it shows up here. And I can then take these forward paired reads um, and then the reverse paired reads and, and pump them right into this mapping step if I wanted. Yeah? So can I just make a quick note here and just attach it to the end? Probably, yeah. Yeah. Um, but you can just add it. So we could say, you know, trim, trim matic and then you can drag it over. Um, so if you click on, so like if we click on Trimomatic, you'll see that the same, uh, the same selections that you made when you ran it in your history or show up here in your workflow. So the same adapters and your um, quali minimum quality score and your length all show up here. And so again, now all of a sudden I'm using this like 20 length and I probably don't ever want to use that again, which is fine. So I can make this workflow a little bit more universal by, um, allowing some of these parameters to be set at runtime. So if I hover over this arrow right here, I get this message that says set at runtime. If I click it, then basically what it says is it's gonna ask me to fill this in before I run it again. Um, so I can do that for, in this case, the, the adapters. 
Um, I'd probably do it for the required quality and then the length. And so I can, and, and this is true of any tool that we look at here. So FastQC is not a good example just because there's not really any inputs that you give. But if I select like BWA mem here, um, it just is everything's like in default right now. Um, and so like I probably don't want to align this data to Arabidopsis because it's not Arabidopsis data. So I probably maybe want to set this at runtime. It is paired, so I can leave it as that. Um, you know, different, different uh, options that come along with these things are all sort of customizable within the workflow as well. And so then if I go and save this, so save, cool. And I go back kind of to that main screen. Um, I can then run the same, the same protocol here, but now as a workflow. So I can go back to workflow. <coughs> I can select run. It's going to show up in the middle here. So here now I would you know, switch my files to make sure they're the right ones. Um, in this case, I'm going to send my results to a new history, which I'll just name. Um, I'm going to make sure and set the things that need to get set, which are down here. So mostly 25 again, min length 90. And then if I click run, and then I go and find my new history. Should be here somewhere. I'm not gonna show up this, but we can go user. Save history. There it goes. Pop the font. Now they all show up kind of as one big thing instead of me having to individually put them in there one by one. And it means that if I get like new data, so I could have from a different data library suck in a couple other FastQ files, then I can use them on that as well. So again, I. I guess I powered through a couple things. So there's a couple ways to find your, your histories that you have. So it's user saved histories. We'll give you this list of histories. Um, I obviously have a lot because I help people with this a lot. Uh, the other nice place is this little pane view, which is like this little window kind of icon. And then you can scroll around, which is nice. The other thing you can do if you're in this view, which is super amazing, and I know it seems weird when I'm going to tell you how amazing this is, but it will change your life if, if you ever used Galaxy before this, is you can drag files from one history into the one that you're currently using, which is the jam. Um, and so this is true for any file from anywhere of your history. So like, I don't know, here's a GTF file from a dog. I don't know why I need it, but I want it in this history, so I'm going to drag it over here. And so that's really nice. Um, and then you can also, so if you have like a specialized genome you need, you know, if you're bacteria people or fungus people, um, or you have big annotation files or something like that, um, your ability to like upload data from a file to Galaxy is, is a little bit limited in that it, c it has to be smaller than two gigs. Um, so when you have files like that, we'll also put them into your, a data library for you. So if you can kind of get them into MSI space in your MSI account, um, if you send in a help ticket that says, hey, can you please add this to my data library, they'll put big files like that in there as well. Um, and so that's a nice place to put anything that you think your lab will share or things that are too big to kind of upload from your personal computer. Um, so getting data into Galaxy is not too horrible, because again, we've got the data library thing. But then also, you've got direct access to like Biomart, 
if I click, you know, this Biomart, under Get Data, Biomart, it's going to shoot me to Biomart. Um, so I can do Biomarty things, and my output, instead of getting like downloaded as a file, will just get downloaded as a history item in Galaxy, which is pretty cool. Um, same thing with the UCSD table browser, which is this guy. Um, so those, that's pretty nice. We've got a lot of uh, genomes that are already in here. So like if we go to this BWA MIM tool, which is not, oh yeah, right here. Um, you know, here's a big list of, no, I can't click on that many. But we, we might have your um, genome already indexed in here and might you might be able to use it. So like, it's weird that's, yeah, so we've got MM10, we've got human. If we don't have it, um, again, you can always use one from your history. If you're a bacteria or fungus person, I would say that just probably just put it in your history because those tend to be small and there's like a bajillion of them. If you're using a plant or you know something that's like a bigger genome, send us a ticket, like a, again, an email to help at MSI and say, hey, can you, do you mind adding this um, genome and then like give us a link to the genome where we can download like a FASTA file of it to Galaxy and then it'll get in there as well. Um, and sometimes it's tool specific. So like BWA might not have it, but HiSET might one have your genome of interest. It's not quite as universal as you would want it to be. Yeah, so this one's got a few more. What the happened to all the plants? There were plants in here, I promise. Um, but yeah, again, if you, if you send an email and ask, you'll probably get what you want, which is nice. And then if there's like a specific tool that we maybe don't have installed, so You've re you're reading a paper, you're like, hey, I really want to try this tool out. You know that it's got a version that is, it goes into Galaxy. Again, if you send an email to help at msi.umn.edu and just say, hey, can you, do you guys mind installing this tool? We'll definitely do that as well. Um, I've installed lots of tools for people um, kind of recently for, for different things. So it's not a big deal um, to ask for a tool to get installed. Any other questions? Oh, data set collections. Okay. I don't really have a good example for this, unfortunately, but we'll, let me see what I have. So data set collections. So you had asked about, okay, nobody has like one sample. That's, that's not why you do sequencing or, you know, genomics experiment. You don't have one sample. You've got like 30 samples. So you've got 30 paired in data sets, which is like 60 files, which is a lot to then individually run all of this garbage with. So Galaxy has this concept called a data set collection. And so what you can do is put, um, so go to your data set library, check all of the boxes, put them all into one history, and then collect them into what's called a data set collection or paired in data set collection. So I'm trying to find a good example. Ooh, this one might be good. All right. So how do you do that? this and this. So oh, as you can see here, we've got a bunch of FASTQ files from a bunch of different samples. We've got R1s and R2s, and there's like a bajillion of them. So that's too many things to like one by one click. So if we, um, we get them all in our history, and then we, on this little checkbox, it's like operations on multiple data sets, we click that. And then um, we can select all, and then for all selected, We'd want to build a list of data set pairs. So now this is a list of R1s and R2s that'll travel together, which is pretty cool. Um, and then it's gonna try to automatically figure out which ones kind of go together. And so um, our file names have these R1 and R2, so I will do it like that. And then you'll see It'll, it'll kind of ask you, hey, did this one really go with this one? Does this one really go with this one? And you can kind of scroll down and be like, yeah, all these things look pretty good. They all seem to go together. So then you can just click auto pair. Um, so, and then we can make a name for it, which is, these are dog, I'm just trying to run star, dog, and seek. Um, 
And then I can also click this um, hide original elements button. So now when I create this list, um, all of those fastq files are going to kind of disappear and I'm just going to have my data set pair, which is, is nice if only to be like clean. Apparently it's going to take a little bit. And then um, when you go to run these tools, instead of submitting individual files, there's going to be another option and it's kind of the folder looking, like manila folder looking option um, that like says, hey, give me a data set collection instead of um, instead of an individual file. So now if I go to FastQC or Termomatic, for all that, ma that matter, uh, I can give it a data set collection, which it doesn't want, think this is. Come on, little buddy. So yeah, I just kind of needed to change all the formats for it, and then it would work fine. Um, let's see if I can just find another tool that'll do this. So trends. <laughs> yeah. So, but then you basically in these drop-down menus, you could get this data set collection first. Um, Unfortunately, I don't know a way of like batch changing attributes because that would just be too useful. Um, so yeah, so so again, the the kind of the workflow would be get all your FastQ files into your history, make sure they're FastQ Sanger, collect them into that data set using the little check mark build a list of data set pairs, and then you can kind of use them as a singular object instead of having to run it 600 times for your 600 samples. Cool. So that's all I have scheduled for today. Um, again, I Galaxy's a really good place to play, and so what ends up happening a lot is, and this is why the dragging files in between histories is your jam. Um, you'll start an analysis, you'll get to a point where you're like, oh, I kind of think what I know what I want to do, but this is really messy, so I'm just going to kind of start over and drag the different bricks um, into the right, uh, you know, into the right order or whatever, and then I'm going to maybe do the workflow thing um, so that I can save it. So that's the other thing, which is, um, let's say you do an analysis and you get the results and the results are pretty cool. You don't actually need to save that whole entire analysis anymore. I mean, those files in between can get really big. Um, you know, I, I had mentioned that if you've got something in a data library that it's not getting replicated a whole lot, but let's say I've got a FastQ file and it's five gigs large, which is not unheard of, and I do a little bit of trimming and now it's like 4.9 gigs large. That is like a new file. Um, so if we do that times 60, it can kind of add up. So if you save the workflow, you can always have the original data, use the workflow, and then have that trim data or that final output again. So if you save the original data and you save the method for how you got there, you don't have to save necessarily all those in-between files. Um, it's not a huge deal just because you get a lot of free storage here at MSI, but just something to think about, being a good you know, data steward. Um, and then you can share histories, workflows, with anybody who then has access to, to this instance of Galaxy. So again, if you have a problem and you email help at msi.un.edu and you're like, I'm a little bit lost, can you please look at this history for me? You would then say, um, you'd wanna share or publish and you wanna just make it accessible um, via a link. And so you just copy and paste this link into the email and then I can open it or one of my colleagues can open it and we can try to uh, figure out what's either going wrong, if you've got like a little red box, or um, help you kind of design your analysis as well. Or you can just, you know, 
send an email again to help and then like come sit in my office for an hour. We can try to figure it out also. <laughs> These are all kind of normal things. Cool. So any other thoughts? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to VPN. If um, so, if you're on UVM Secure or EDU Realm, you can just get access. If you're at home or you know, at your, your university, you're gonna have to VPN. Um, what's nice is, um, you know, it's just like using a web page. So it sh hopefully the interface shouldn't be too slow. And again, you're not doing any of the computation like on your computer. It's all happening on the computers in the basement. So hopefully the VPN won't slow you down too much. Whereas when I try to work from home, sometimes I get really mad at the VPN because, like, heaven forbid, I have to download a file. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. So that's the other thing is if you ever do need to download a file, download with this little file icon. Um, Galaxy can also make you a graph, um, which is pretty cool. I don't really have anything graphy right now, but these visualizations, it's got a built-in... Um, so this track browser is basically like built in IGV. It's OK. I would say use IGV instead. Um, for some of these files, we link out to IGV. Um, well, yeah, but now they just want to, that's what Trackster is. It's kind of this, this um, genome browser. Again, it's OK. Uh, you, but you can make scatter plots. You can make heat maps. You can make all sorts of things. Um, and you're going to do that kind of through this uh, visualizations tab. And it's basically looking for anything that's kind of a tab delimited file. So if you've got counts of something, or um, what did I try to make a heat map? Yeah, mostly like numbers and locations, something like that by samples. Then you can make plots from that as well. Um, I haven't done as much graphing in Galaxy. So if you guys run into problems, I will be happy to help, but I might not. I might have to play with it a little bit. <laughs> um, Galaxy is also a huge community. So the uh, Galaxy Wikipedia page has tons of information. So if, like if you go to use Galaxy, yes.org, this is like the main public Galaxy site. Um, if you go to help, and then Galaxy Biostars, the wiki, all these places has tons of information. Um, and other tutorials, and then if you see tools that like in one of these tutorials or on the main, you know, the main public Galaxy site that you're like, hey, I really want to be able to use that tool, again, just send an email in and we'll install it into our instance of Galaxy. And again, this instance of Galaxy and our instance of Galaxy don't talk to each other. So like we can't click on shared data, data libraries and find all the stuff we've seen before because they don't know about each other. They're so completely separate. I mean, this is running on computers in a basement in Texas somewhere. Um, they just happen to share a framework. So I'm, you're making, does that make sense? Okay. So there's mm, uh, public servers. Yes. 80 plus public Galaxy servers exist on this planet. So these are just people who host Galaxy instances that do a bunch of different stuff. There's at least one of these that is actually all about processing imaging data. I mean, so some of them aren't even genomic. And so each individual Galaxy server, while running ga like the software Galaxy, might have different tools, but it runs somewhere different. You might not have access to all of them, and they don't necessarily talk to each other. So if you have collaborators, and they have an instance of Galaxy, and they email you like a file that's one of those workflows, you can definitely like upload it here. It just might not work, because they might not have the exact same tools or something like that. And again, though, if, if that's something that you're trying to do, just send an email and we can really try to work with you to get the tools that they have installed installed here, and then it should probably work. Or we can kind of recreate it from scratch also. So, yeah. Um, but anyway, Google's your friend. And there's a lot of stuff about like data set collections on the wiki, uh, which is good. Anything else? Okay. So again, you'll get your email from UMGC that says, hey, you've got data. You can just forward it to us. You'll get a data library. We'll tell you the name of the data library, but it's going to be the PI of your group, or if you're the PI's last name, probably. Um, from there, you know, you now know how to trim. And then um, there are 
other tutorials on the website about like RNA-seq, or there's a one about using GTK as well. And so now that you guys have kind of touched Galaxy, those should be pretty easy to follow along with. And again, if you run into problems, always send an email. We are around. Cool. Yeah, my pleasure. Turn this off.